Well, welcome everyone to the course development workshop series, Scaffolding the Summative. My name is Kate Johnson. I am the Associate Director of Faculty Development at UAGC. Um, for those of you who have been following the series, and I hope that you have, uh, last week, or excuse me, last week, wouldn't that be fun? Last month, we did um, a workshop series on summative assignments. Uh, and do a, to do a quick recap of that session, the summative assessment evaluates student learning at the end of a unit or course, explicitly aligns to the CLOs, is an opportunity for students to show what they've learned in the course, and should be used as a guide for facilitating learning throughout the course. So let's do a little bit of activity. Hi from Phoenix. Hi, Christopher. Um, what is uh, a summation about summative assignments? How <laughs> very meta, Dan, very meta. So let's get, let's get even more meta. Just kidding. We're going to talk about scaffolding. Now let's put what your idea of scaffolding is in the chat. And it's okay if it's not specifically um, course related if your only introduction to scaffolding has to do with construction on your house, because I assure you it will be relevant. Pyramids and ladders. Okay. Building blocks, one step at a time to create a whole concept, a clear framework, building up step by step to a new skill, building on ideas to lay the foundation for other ideas, love it, building on skills and concepts, levels, I say building on each previous step, staircases, staircase towards a summative assignment. Charles, did you get a preview of this? Concepts, building upon one another, laying foundations, one on top of the other. All of those are accurate. So let's talk about um, what, how we're specifically defining scaffolding before we move a little bit further. It's, it's easier if when I say scaffolding and the team says that scaffolding that you know what we're talking about. So what is scaffolding? Scaffolding is structurally supportive interactions that guide effective learning. And then what is the goal of scaffolding as it relates to course development is to meet learners where they are in their knowledge and experiences and use that information to aid them in reaching the next learning goal. So let's talk a little bit about um, scaffolding. Uh, as it relates to Lev Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. Um, you know what, let me just double check. Let me play and if it doesn't, if you can't hear it, let me know. You've probably noticed that there are things you can do on your own and things that are impossible to do. But there are also certain things in kind of a middle zone that you can't do on your own quite yet, but you can accomplish with a little bit of help. And that help might be from a teacher, from a parent or guardian, or from a peer. But it might also be a resource like a book, a video, or a podcast. This is true not only of gaining new skills, but also learning new information or understanding new concepts. In 1962, the Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky called this space the Zone of Proximal Development, or ZPD. He developed this idea as a criticism of psychometric testing in education, which viewed intelligence as permanent and fixed. Now, here's how ZPD works. At the center, you have the things that you can do on your own. On the outside, you have the things that you cannot do on your own. But in this middle zone, you have the zone of proximal development, which are the things that you can do with guidance and support. In 1976, Jerome Bruner applied Vygotsky's theory to the educational setting with the concept of scaffolding. Here, educators provide supports called scaffolds to help students master the learning. Then, like the scaffolds in a building, teachers pull back the scaffolds as students master the knowledge and the supports become unnecessary. At this point, the ZPD grows outwards as students master new knowledge with new scaffolds. Now with scaffolds, you tap into prior knowledge and build on it with key supports. These might be tutorials and videos or visual aids. They might also involve using sentence stems or front-loading vocabulary for language. You might provide leveled reading, graphic organizers, or additional think time. Or it might mean breaking down directions into smaller tasks. 
Scaffolding can be challenging. It takes time and energy, which is a struggle with large class sizes. But when it works, it can lead to better learning and deeper thinking. And subscribing is completely up to you. Um, so the zone of proximal development, as they talked about, is Vygotsky's theory. So if you think about what a learner can do unaided, so if my daughter wants to get herself a bowl of vanilla yogurt, she can go get the yogurt, she can get the bowl, she can go get the spoon. What she cannot do is get the yogurt into the bowl without getting half of the container all over the counter. So what I do in between is I will hold on to the container of yogurt and I will hand over hand help her scoop. Eventually, as she can scoop on her own, I will remove that scaffold. And then eventually I will remove my hand from the container of yogurt so that she gets to the ability to be able to do all of what the learner can do unaided. So I know we're gonna talk about a lot of different examples of scaffolding um, and they're not all gonna do with yogurt. They are going to do, deal with applying uh, this work to course development. So I am going to hand it over to Natalie to talk a little bit about um, the link. Hi, this is Trisha Lauer. I'm actually going to cover this slide, Kate. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Trisha Lauer. I'm the Vice President of Assessment and Curriculum Affairs. And want to hear from all of you in the chat a little bit now that you've um, seen our collective definition for the purposes of what we're discussing today and heard a little bit more in the video to think about your own classroom and your own teaching and curriculum development experiences and what then do you see as your primary link between the zone of proximal development and scaffolding? Take a moment in the chat and share some ideas. Thank you, Tanya. Thinking about adjusting the scaffolding as the, the zone changes, that's exactly right. And Pamela, I love that, understanding where the student is and the type of scaffolding that is needed. Um, because it's not a one size fits all, but in thinking of how we create learning opportunities for, for students of varied experiences and expertise within a classroom. Exactly. There are external requirements and things that we need to keep in mind when we're creating um, these different learning opportunities. And I think Jen's going to talk a little more about that. Kate, can you click one link? One, one time I'm going to add some text to the slide. Some ideas that, that I thought of. Uh, thank you, Martha. Changing the change occurs. Some just ideas for you to think about as um, as you're creating courses or thinking about your own teaching in a class, um, we're building the course through that lens of developing, facilitating. I know when I, when I visit with many of you, we often talk about um, how, how interwoven the teaching and the learning aspect is. Um, you, you teach and you should always also design in this way, thinking about how ZPD and scaffolding are intertwined and how we support students in increasing that circle as we move throughout the five or six weeks of a course. Next slide. I can unmute myself. Hi, everybody. This is Nikki Perry. I'm the manager of curriculum and assessment. And I wanted to discuss how scaffolding relates to learning outcome alignment. Um, so as we saw in that video, you saw the house and you saw the scaffolding as they're building the house. You can think of one of the aspects of that home being your learning outcomes, which is why through all of these webinars, if you've attended several of them, I really stress the importance of having really strong, measurable, and achievable learning outcomes to set yourself up for success and set your students up for success and really build that solid base for learning. 
So just some things to keep in mind as you're working on your course developments and you're thinking about scaffolding and alignment is to make sure that you're aligning your assignments and your learning resources, your textbooks, your videos, whatever you're creating to your CLOs. And this will help ensure cohesion throughout the course and throughout the weeks as the students build on those learning outcomes. Um, something to keep in mind if you're doing a course revision and the course has already run several times is prior to that revision, you'll get a course snapshot from your assessment specialist. They'll show you where the alignment is between your learning outcomes and your, um, your assignments. And you can see if there's a disconnect or a connect. And Julie, I see that you mentioned QM and that is actually one of the things I was thinking about as well and kind of relates to the last bullet point here, which is making sure that alignment is clear for the students. So I'm sure we've all been in classes or even projects at work or other things in our personal lives where we really don't see the connection. Why am I doing this assignment? Why am I reading this textbook, et cetera? And that can be really detrimental for students because not only is it not building them forward and working on that scaffolding, it also can kind of deter motivation when students don't understand why they're learning something, why they're doing an activity, and it's not helping their overall knowledge and learning. So yeah, next slide. So we wanted to show you some examples of what does this look like in action when we're thinking about developing and designing our courses here at UAGC? How do we actually bring these, this idea of scaffolding into our courses? Thinking about when students are in that ZPD and we're designing our courses that way, how do we use our teachers, right? Us as instructors, how do we utilize and tap on their classmates and their peers? How do we use our resources to build that scaffolding so that we are setting them up for success so that they go from what they couldn't do on their own to what they're able to do on their own because of the supports we provided. So right now up on the screen is an example of a summative assignment from one of our courses, one of our education courses in which the students uh, this particular summative assignment has two parts. The first part is that they're working on a thematic unit. And as you can see, as you're looking at the directions, there's some elements of designing, revising, and finalizing. And we're going to break down what that looks like for those scaffolded supports in a minute. And the second part has to do with some reflection and for them having to really bring in all of their logic and reasoning and thinking about how they got to where they were with this um, thematic unit they designed. So Kate, if you can go to the next slide, what does this look like when you're thinking about your summative and how you go back and scaffold to bring in those supports? Well, throughout this particular course, we provided scaffolding in this way. We started by just with foundational knowledge, kind of like we did today. Let's build some background about what is scaffolding. In this course, we did the same thing. We examined what is a thematic unit? What makes a thematic unit? And then we broke it into those steps that some of you were talking about when Kate asked what is scaffolding, the ideas of, a, of steps or climbing up a ladder and having students choose a theme and looking at the first part of creating that unit, which was determining their goals, objectives, and standards for those first few lessons they were designing. With those essential pieces in place to help guide the alignment of their unit, then we felt they were confident and ready and had the supports they needed to work on one entire lesson. But we just broke it to one lesson rather than writing their entire unit so that we could tap on providing feedback, bringing in resources, getting um, feedback and con conversations and connections with their peers. So they had that support to continue to build and grow their knowledge because we weren't ready to pull all those supports away from them yet. Then in week four, we had them do some evaluation, some of that metacognition, thinking about what do I know? What have I learned? Where do I need to adjust? Why do I need to adjust? Helping them to have the opportunity to interact with both in their instructor and their peers to have conversations about what's going well, where do I still have some growth, where am I still struggling so that the instructor knew who still needed those supports in place and who was ready to have those supports pulled away. And then finally, in the summative where they went back and made some revisions and were able to complete their two new lessons to apply all the new learning they had throughout the course. So that's kind of a big overview of what the scaffolding looked like. And then on the next slide, Kate, we broke down some of the examples like they shared in the videos about all of the things that can be supports or scaffolding in our courses, like tutorials, videos, visuals, sentence stems, et cetera. So here's some examples of some ways that you can integrate those into your course design. You can have interactives that 
help to explain content and information, completing those first to give the students an opportunity to learn content and engage with content in a different way than through just reading in their textbook or articles. Another thing, and this was shared in the video we watched today too, is presenting our content in multiple modalities. We have students who like to read information. We have students who want to hear information. We have students that need to engage in conversation with others to gain that information. So presenting the content in multiple modalities is a great way to scaffold. Providing opportunities in the discussion forums for students to seek clarity, letting our students know to say, this is where I'm stuck. How can I get some help and support? Or this is what went really well for me and giving them opportunities to reflect and pause and show where they're stuck or to show where those aha and light bulb moments have gone off for them. Also, another way to bring in scaffolding is to have to design the course in a way that students are able to receive feedback and read that feedback and consider how to implement it before next steps or nor, uh, next pieces of assignments or summatives are due. And then also another way that you can bring in some scaffolding to support that summative is providing opportunities for narrative reflections. In this particular course, it was done weekly to reflect on lesson development, but giving the students the opportunity to stop and pause and reflect on their own learning each week. So we're going to show you another example of a course um, that's not from the education um, courses that we have so that we can show some examples of what scaffolding looks like across different disciplines too. So Kate, if you advance the slide one more time, this particular example of a summative is from um, psychology three, 350 is what this particular one is from. And in this particular course, students are studying psychology, right? They're looking at different behaviors. They're looking at the brain. And this particular summative has two pieces to it as well. In the first part, they're doing their analysis where they're looking at really demonstrating information, analyzing behaviors, analyzing how the brain works and the different pathways in the brain. They're doing a lot of research with an annotated bibliography and pulling in the pieces that they're actually going to use to complete part two, which is building their TED Talk. And I wanted to give a shout out to Dana Dillard for help um, letting us share from this particular course with us. So thank you, Dana. Um, and then they record a TED Talk. So if you advance the slide, Kate, we'll show you, well, how did, how did Dana break this down in her course to incorporate scaffolding so that her students would be successful? Well, in the first week, she had them start to think about what was a topic of interest to them, right? Getting them really starting to dig into those topics, thinking ahead to what's happening, but knowing that what they needed to do in that first week was really just explore what are some different, con or different topics that are related to physiological psychology. Then in week two, she had them have the opportunity to collaborate and learn from and with their peers about pathways and functions of the brain. And this was a piece, a chunk of what is happening as far as core content that they need when they get to the summative. Then in week three, they started their planning for their final project. She was building in that scaffolding, bringing in the opportunity for students to start laying out what was going to happen and also having them complete their annotated bibliography so that they could start to gather resources that they were going to need and that they could use those resources to inform the content that they were putting into their final project. In week four, they completed a reflective journal on their own style of learning. And they were, she used this as a scaffold so that when they were developing their TED Talk in week five, they could think about how do they learn so that they could incorporate those strategies into the way they were presenting their content in the TED Talk. And then finally in week five, they had opportunities to revise and build on what they had been doing in week one in their journal, in their week three project planning and feedback they had received from throughout the course. So uh, next slide, please, Kate. So it's just some more examples of ways that we can bring that scaffolding in, in, thinking again back to the video and the idea of, well, what do these resources look like? Or how do we do this in these online courses that we teach? So you can bring in weekly reviews of content to help ensure that they understand what's happening and that they're not missing pieces of core information. Um, in this particular course, Dana, she used her blooms levels and increased them throughout. So she started with lower level of learning in the first couple of weeks and then each week walked up those stairs that we talked about to increase the levels of learning. So she started with the foundational information and then took it to the next level and the next level as students went and in their summative in week five, the highest level of creation where they were creating their TED talk to demonstrate 
that they were experts in this field. Um, again, you can present content in multiple modalities, whether it's through videos, or through articles, through interactives, through having students look at blogs, you know, just thinking about there's information in different ways and everyone learns differently. Providing discussion forums that have opportunities for students to seek clarity. Again, bringing in the opportunity to get feedback to our students so they have that information to build on for the next steps. And finally, another great way to scaffold is providing opportunity for students to connect what they know and their own experiences to what they're learning about in the course. So hopefully those give you some ideas of ways we can scaffold the summative and you can kind of think about and chew on those for a little bit. And here's your warning. We're going to do some practice with how we can scaffold a summative at the end. So make sure you stick some of these ideas in your head. You're going to need them in a little bit. And with that, I'm going to hand things off. The slide looks like it's stuck, Kate. There we go. There we go. All right. Um, before I get started, are there any questions? I know Jen uh, went over a lot of content there. Um, I thought maybe we should pause here and see if uh, anyone had any questions for her that she could address before we keep moving forward. We'll give you a little time to type. Yes, Holly, I'll put that, uh, I'll put the link to the video in the chat. Great question. Uh, provide a role model answer using different data. Yeah, Holly, I can, I can email out the chat. If you'll find that helpful, absolutely. Yeah, and Suzanne, role models are a great way to bring in some scaffolding too, really, you know, thinking about doing some scenarios, some role play type of things, giving students the opportunity, like you said, to answer. Mm -hmm. um, the chat just jumped on me to answer um, using different data or information and to see things from different perspectives. Those are great ideas and really connect to the, you know, everyone's going to need some different types of support. So letting them look at things through different lenses and different angles will help you to be able to do that. The timing of the feedback loop, Judy or Julie. Yeah. So um, we structured it where there was like a almost like a down week is the best way I could explain it in between when they would get feedback. So they had um, in week one, they would do some work with looking at themes and choosing a theme. And then they would before they had to implement that, they had a week before we could give them feedback. Week three, they did their for, uh, their first full lesson. And then their summative wasn't due until week five, so they had the opportunity. But that's a great question and a great thing to point out that when you're working on course design and building in those opportunities for feedback to balance the time so that you're not having an assignment due on Monday and then the next assignment for the next week starts that on that Tuesday so that you have the chance to get feedback to your students. So yeah, really trying to map it out that way. We definitely took that into account um, in the education course that I shared. And I think that Dana probably did the same thing in hers. Um, but yeah, so we built in, tried to build in down weeks where the students were still working on other tasks, but maybe we're taking a step away from the assignment that they were getting feedback on that they were gonna need to build on in the future. Does that answer your question, Julie? Yeah, and Jen, you talked in here too about providing video explanations. Absolutely, and that goes back to where we talked about sharing information in multiple formats. For example, in the course where we shared about lesson planning, we have a lesson planning handbook that we designed for our students. Then we also, um, have videos that break down each section of our lesson planning and then in the interactives they interact and engage with information about planning lessons too so really trying to get the information to our students in different ways and those video explanations are so helpful for our auditory learners and students who want to hear it explained rather than read about it yeah and Suzanne too yep billion assignments that give opportunities for collaboration about the learning objectives. Some of the most powerful discussions I've done lately are ones where students are making connections back to what their objectives are or giving students the opportunity to choose artifacts and information to demonstrate their own learning and understanding of learning objectives. So all of those are really powerful. 
Yeah, Julie, you could absolutely do scaffolding in terms of providing a second discussion forum in some weeks. We actually talked about this a little bit yesterday um, in the development dish too, about the idea of just having a forum where students have the opportunity to ask questions or like a stuck in the mud forum. Where do you need help? Where do you need clarity? Or you, you know, a place where students could come and celebrate things that were going well or looking for other feedback from their peers. So that's a great way to do it and to provide the support that students need too. Well, awesome general thoughts keep, in the chat. Yeah, general keep um, watch of the chat and we will move on to Ms. Erickson. Okay, hello, I'm Amy Erickson. I'm a coach in the faculty development. And um, as you will probably notice, there is going to be some overlap between uh, tactics you can use when developing courses, as well as tactics you can use inside the classroom. So as the video noted, um, one of the elements of scaffolding is simplifying. Um, so think about are there ways that you can simplify content without oversimplifying it? Remember, we don't want content to be too easy. Then the students, it's not challenging enough and we don't want it to be obviously too, too difficult. Um, so Kate, if you could please um, move forward. I love this example. Um, if you were teaching students about rhetorical fallacies and you gave them this definition, discounting evidence for anecdotal evidence, uh, it's discounting evidence arrived at by systematic search or testing in favor of a few firsthand stories. So that's not really very helpful, is it? Um, but if you break it down for students by giving them an example, it may be easier to understand than simply the definitions. So um, Kate, if you could uh, advance the slide, please. So an example of anecdotal evidence is, I'm gonna carry on smoking. My grandfather smoked 40 a day and he lived until he was 90. So that's a lot more relevant to students, isn't it? They can understand uh, what anecdotal evidence is and how it's not based on any research or any um, facts or data or evidence. So um, another thing you could possibly do is ask students to give examples they've seen in their own lives of people using anecdotal evidence um, in arguments. And now when we think about sim simplifying, we wanna consider what students already learned in their current class or in prerequisites for the class. So if students haven't yet learned how to use the library, asking them to find peer reviewed resources from the last five years from the ProQuest database is not going to be helpful. So you wanna build upon what they already know. And, and as we talked about this staircase moving up gradually um, so they feel that the content is attainable. Um, Kate, if you could go ahead and forward that. Oh, you went backward, there we go. One more, there we go. So uh, another way to scaffold content is through modeling. Um, perhaps you create a video showing how to walk through the various steps of a task. Um, this mirroring is a really valuable teaching tool and helps to make important connections in the brain. Um, students can then see themselves performing the task. Uh, you could create a PowerPoint or a Prezi to outline steps toward a, a certain skill, or you could get a problem skill or task started for a student. For example, if you were going over paragraph development, you may provide students with a strong topic sentence to get them started. Uh, and Kate, if you could move forward again. Okay, another element um, is maintaining attention, attention and engagement in the classroom. So how do we keep students engaged throughout the scaffolded learning experience? Uh, some ideas include humor, uh, appropriate of course, mnemonic devices, storytelling narratives, um, approaches that appeal to visual, kinesthetic, auditory learners, and even novelty. Remember the brain really likes novelty like cats in hats that look like pineapples. So Kate, if you could please move forward again. Oops, there you go. Um, finally, uh, Vygotsky believed that we learn through social interactions. So as an instructor, you can open up announcements to allow for more discussion and collaboration. You can use the discussions to connect with students or even different with, I'm sorry, to connect students with similar ideas or even different ideas to further discuss the content at hand. Um, you can create a video to model the skills you want students to learn. Or if you do this, as we mentioned in the previous slide, you can add that to the discussion. And that way you can discuss the content, answer questions, or even ask students for ways to make the video even better. Um, finally, another way to learn through social interaction and, and through scaffolding is, can students create a model to teach their peers? Um, these are all ways that you can, uh, all, you know, different types of approaches in the classroom that involve scaffolding, but don't necessarily involve course development. So um, I'm done, Kate, if you want to go ahead and, and uh, 
advance the slide. Okay, so we wanted to take some time now to have the chance to put what we've been talking about into practice. And we um, borrowed the summative assignment from Business 303. So thank you so much to Leah Westerman and the bus uh, business faculty for letting us borrow this assignment. And we wanted to brainstorm some ideas. If this was your summative assignment, what would you do to try and scaffold throughout the course? What are some ideas that you have? They could be general ideas or they could be something where you look at something that's happening in this assignment and you have a specific thought. So go ahead and post some ideas in the chat. We know it might take a minute for you to read through the summative to start to get those creative ideas flowing in terms of how you could scaffold support throughout the course for this summative. Ooh, that's a great one, Tish. I have them do some interviewing of someone in the field. That's a great way to start to build some of that foundational knowledge. You could do that towards the beginning of the course so that they get the chance to maybe look at those different content areas and gain some ideas and insight. That'll apply to different learning modalities too than someone just reading about what those things look like, but having the chance to connect and talk with somebody about it. Yeah, doing some observations. Yeah, Dan, having some discussion topics about specific aspects of the final paper that will really bring in where it talked about, you know, we can leverage ourselves as, support, as scaffolding in the courses, but we can also leverage peers, right? And our students will be able to interact and gain different ideas and insight and information from their peers. Reviewing policies and bringing them into the real world. Real world application is so important. Well, now the chat is spinning fast. Let me scroll back up. Comparing and contrasting different systems. Yep. Asking them difficulty they've experienced, locating and keeping talents. That's great and goes back to what we talked about, about activating prior knowledge or any time that we can connect to what the students' own experiences are. It helps them. Ooh, creating an ad for an open position and a list of questions to be asked at the interview. And then you could even maybe do something with that, Beverly, of if that was in a discussion forum where they create their ad and then their peers maybe respond as somebody interested in the ad to really get some of that engaging conversation going. And then they can use that information when they're um, constructing their summative. Really awesome ideas. And you guys help me out with things I'm missing in the chat. It's jumping so quickly. Experiences they've had with HR inviting an expert to present to the class in a Zoom call. These are great ideas. And this is where, like when we talked about in the session last month about starting with the summative and creating your summative first, when you know where you're headed, when you know what that end goal is and you have it down on paper, then you guys can see just from the ideas you've shared in the chat. And I know we have several of our business faculty here, but we have a lot of us who teach in other disciplines. You can see how quickly you can start to think backwards from where you have that summative and think about, all right, how do I go back from here? What do I need to know? What are the things that my students need to know? And how do I help to do them? in a variety of ways to provide all of that scaffolding and support that our students need. Really awesome ideas. Creating evaluations and those get to those higher level of Bloom's verbs. You could even have them start with something if you did an evaluation where maybe they do it, maybe they create a draft of their evaluation that they want and then they post it in a discussion forum to get feedback from their peers and then they can revise and then implement their evaluation. So you guys can see how once you have the ideas, then you just have to think about, okay, what would I have to do first? Or how could I get some connection here? Or how might I need to break this into steps to overall help there to be the supports that are needed while students are still mastering information before they're ready to demonstrate what they can do on their own in that summative assignment. Julie, you also made a great point about um, the creating the ad idea immediately engages the student in active learning in a fun way, um, but also makes it meaningful. So they're not simply doing a task just to do a task because it's required of them for class. It's something that if they were in the HR major, um, perhaps that is something that they would be doing in their real job uh, once they are either promoted, if they currently work and need the promotion to move up, or um, if they're looking to get into the field. So thinking about how the work that we're doing, asking those bigger questions about your industry, um, what do students 
need to know and understand and be capable of doing uh, can be helpful in determining what, what items you pick, what activities uh, students are engaging in so that it's not only fun and active, but as we know with andragogy, it's relevant to their life uh, because that's what adult learners are looking for. Yeah. So, so many great ideas in the chat and we hope that it's helped you to get some ideas flowing in your own brains when you're thinking about different courses you're either working on or that you know that are coming up in terms of how can you bring that scaffolding into your course to provide support for your students. And next month, we're going to be focusing on formative assessments. So we have been focusing a lot at the end. Um, so whether you come from an education background or you read uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Successful People back in the late 90s, as I did um, for your business class, uh, working with the end in mind is always helpful as we're, as we're trying to design courses uh, for student learning, maximum student learning. Um, formative assessments are a buildup to those summative assessments. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that today. Are there any other questions in chat that we have a little bit of time? And I know that this we offered a lot of really rich content and you guys offered back a ton of great suggestions and ideas. Um, and if there are any questions that you have about uh, you know, what we offered, we'd be happy to take a couple of minutes and chat. Um, the other thing I just want to ensure uh, for those of you who um, have not already attended or who are, aren't attending regularly, please join us at the development dish on Tuesdays. Uh, it is a open um, conversation. The conversation is dictated by the questions that or the, um, the help that is needed by faculty who attend all UAGC faculty are welcome. Uh, we really, really have a lot of fun and um, people are very vulnerable and asking for help and we're all learning as we're going. It's a, it's a really beautiful learning community. So if you have not attended any of those, please uh, join us next Tuesday. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. We appreciate uh, your uh, attendance and your your taking the opportunity to learn. Again, next month, we'll focus on formative assessments. And if you have any questions for us, please feel free to send us an email. Thanks, all.